was a high schooler um, and even younger, I struggled with a pretty severe eating disorder um, and depression, anxiety, many things. Um, and I spent most of my youth getting help and being in treatment. Uh, when I was in high school, I found an organization um, that was peer led and we went around to middle schools and high schools around the Bay Area doing presentations trying to raise awareness and prevent eating disorders. And that was one of the things that really helped me to recover. My name is Remy Abrishami. I'm a peer counselor, bring change to mind club leader, and a junior. Can you please start off by telling us about yourself and why you do what you do? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Remy, for inviting me. Um, so I am here because I am the senior manager of California for Bring Change to Mind. Um, so you will be joining one of our many schools here in Southern California. Uh, and I help to manage high schools here within the greater LA area um, and I manage some stuff at the higher state level as well, um, partnerships and things like that. Could you explain what the Bring Change to Mind organization consists of? Yeah, so Bring Change to Mind is a national nonprofit that was co-founded in 2010 by actress and activist Glenn Close, who um, many people your age will know as the OG Corella DeVille <laughs> from 101 Dalmatians. Um, and she co-founded it with her sister Jessie and her nephew Kaylin. Uh, so we focus on decreasing the stigma surrounding mental illness. One of our main programs is our high school program. So we have peer-led evidence-based mental health clubs in high schools. Um, so the clubs are education and advocacy based and they're event and activity driven. So we really want the students who are running these mental health clubs and who are participating in them to run different events and activities um, and present, do presentations to help educate and advocate at their high school's campuses. I see, so like with these club meetings, what are like the discussions? What do you guys talk about, bring awareness to? Yeah, so because we work across the entire US, we work in all sorts of different communities. Um, so we are not curriculum based. We don't have a specific set curriculum for students to go through. So that allows us the flexibility to um, have like all sorts of different information for students to use and to be able to choose that will fit their own community and what uh, their community is struggling with or they would like to have more knowledge around. So really, uh, the topics, they really, really vary. <laughs> we have more than 50 presentations in our club portal, um, and those presentations go through so many different things. So we have a whole intersectionality and in mental health um, section. So, you know, with different cultures or with different communities, we have um, presentations that are specific to certain mental illnesses. So if clubs would like to be educated about signs and symptoms of certain different mental illnesses and maybe how to help a friend struggling or how to seek help. Um, so there's so many different things it's kind of hard to answer but really the overall answer is most things teenagers want to be talking about um, or is culturally relevant we probably have it in our club portal <laughs> I love that that's yeah. amazing out of like the years that you've worked with these clubs what do you think is like the most important topic or like mm -hmm. some of the most important topics yeah I would say it varies year to year yeah. and it varies community to community but um, the topics that really um, are always kind of in the top five topics are depression, anxiety, stress, those three. I see, mm -hmm. okay. So I wanted to ask you, what does bring change to mind mean? That's a great question. So um, the, the mission of Bring Change to Mind is decreasing the stigma surrounding mental health. But when they founded it, it was really all about getting the conversation started to bring change to people's minds. <laughs> 
So pretty straightforward. <laughs> All right. I yeah. like that. Okay. So lastly, how and why did you get involved in Bring Change to Mind, the organization? Yeah, uh, great question. So typically people get involved either because um, they have struggled themselves or they know somebody who has struggled. So when I was a high schooler um, and even younger, I struggled with a pretty severe eating disorder um, and depression, anxiety many things um, and I spent most of my youth getting help and being in treatment. Uh, when I was in high school, I found an organization um, that was peer led and we went around to middle schools and high schools around the Bay Area doing presentations trying to raise awareness and prevent eating disorders. And that was one of the things that really helped me to recover. Um, so when I was in college, I got into the nonprofit world. Um, after college, I wanted to be a therapist. Kind of changed my mind and I, I found Bring Change to Mind and was like, whoa, this is wild. It um, put together a lot of skill sets I had from many different random jobs, but also the program is very similar to the thing that helped me in my own healing process. Um, and I think it's very important to uh, educate students at a younger age when these things are popping up. So 50% of mental illnesses start by the time, um, by the age of 14. So that's when students are going into high school. Um, so if we can have conversations around these issues, then maybe people will reach out for help a lot earlier. Yeah, I like what you said about um the thing that you're in being peer led because you know mm -hmm. we have you know the peer counseling mm -hmm. and the Norman Aid Center so I think it's really important that like you know we're being awareness but it's not only the you know staff members it's like actual peers that may yeah. go through the same exact things totally. so yeah I love what you said yeah yeah because when I was in that peer led program when I was younger I was around other people who were also recovering from an eating disorder, but they were doing well and they wanted to recover. So I was seeing peers my age who were like doing the same work I was, which is very different than, um, you know, seeing adults and, and maybe hearing their story or not. It was, it was more motivating to me at the time. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm a peer counselor and I'm senior. And should we get started? Keep yeah. on going with all the questions? Yes, please. <laughs> all right, so first I have to ask you, why is it important to bring awareness and to, to make the future stigma-free? Uh, yes. Um, um, oh, sorry. Especially in high schools, why is it really important? Yes, so 50% of all mental illnesses start by the age of 14, so when you're coming into high school. Um, but then also another really wild statistic is that on average, it takes people eight to 10 years to receive help. So, right? Wow. So long. Yeah. But think about it. If, if um, an issue is starting when you're 14, you have four years of high school, and if you're not reaching out for help, you're just kind of struggling because you have no idea what's going on. And then you go to college and then you're on your own and you're just trying to get through college. So that statistic makes sense. But if there are resources in place at a school, uh, then hopefully people will reach out for help a lot earlier than those eight to 10 years, you know? Um, so all that takes is getting the conversation started. Uh, but then on top of that, getting the conversation started younger will hopefully um, change the culture nationwide. Um, I forget the term for it, but it's like, um, a cohort replacement. <laughs> so um, if you think about it, like um, way back in the day, there used to be like no seatbelt laws, right? You could just be in a car without a seatbelt. And then the laws came in. Um, but of course, if you've been driving for a long time without a seatbelt, you're going to be like, I don't need my seatbelt. <laughs> and it's a new habit you have to form. But they're teaching children you need to wear a seat belt and they're also saying like remind your parents to wear the seat belt so that's kind of what like cohort replacement is right like kids are 
are learning like something new and reminding their parents. <laughs> yeah, and then and, it becomes a habit. Yeah, um, and it's already going to be an ingrained habit for them by the time they're older. So if you think about this with mental health, um, think about your generation. Your generation is already becoming much more open about talking about mental health. And then you're also bringing those conversations home to your parents. Maybe it's not changing anything with your parents, but it's starting something new. And the hope is also that when you're older, that's just gonna now be the culture. You won't have to start a conversation. The conversation will just be there. The conversation will be there and you can talk to your kids about it. Exactly. You can teach your kids about different things. Yeah. What advice would you give to your past self when you were in high school, when you were struggling? What would you tell yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would tell my high school self um, that they are doing a great job and that uh, that she is allowed to use her voice and state when things are wrong and uh, to keep going. Yeah, because you always have to keep keep on going. Yeah. Um, do you think it's hard for high school students to even recognize when there is a problem and when they think like a problem within themselves? Mm. When, how, when to recognize when to get help? Yeah, one of the things I've seen at Bring Change to Mind is that many students don't realize there's a problem and they come to a club meeting and they learn about many different topics on mental health. And then they realize that they, they might actually be struggling. They actually find the words to what they're feeling. I would almost relate that to um, most people have had this experience where they might be feeling something, but they listen to a song and it's like, oh yeah, that's what I'm feeling. <laughs> like sometimes we don't have vocabulary or words around something. Um, and students who join the club will have that experience and um, be able to put words around something they are struggling with. So then they know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the other big part of the club is uh, ensuring that club leaders and club members know what resources are available for whatever they're talking about. So that's a, a really big part of every club meeting is if they're gonna talk about a certain topic, ensure to always come back to the resources that are available in case anybody needs some support or help. And those resources can be within the school, so whatever resources you have here, or uh, local resources in the community, or even nationwide resources. What do you think is the hardest part about being, um, like, yeah, what do you think was the hardest part about being a high school student here um, in this day and age with this time? Mm. So what I am seeing, like, okay, I think um, what I am noticing seems to be some of the most difficult things for teenagers in high school this day and age is both a pro and a con. I think the overwhelming amounts and access to information um, because it is no longer just you and your community or maybe what is happening in your country, but you have constant access to what is happening around the world. And while that is also so beautiful and can help in many different ways, I also think that is incredibly difficult to know what to do with as your brain is still developing. <laughs> it can become scary. Yes, and the other thing too, I think, um, uh, I think eco-anxiety 
is another really big thing. Eco anxiety? Yeah, have you heard that term? I haven't. <laughs> Tell me about so, it. So, um, I do think that eco anxiety, it might be not as widespread. So, I will say, um, because I work here in Southern California with teenagers, um, so within our own, you know, culture here, I notice it. Yeah. Eco anxiety is. Um, the overwhelming feelings and anxiety and dread um, that comes with uh, the knowledge of climate change. That's really interesting. Yeah, it eco is. Eco anxiety. Yeah, eco anxiety. I can see that, especially because of TikTok. I like once you say eco anxiety, I can kind of mm. see how I, I even experience that myself. Mm hmm. Um, See, putting a term <laughs> to a feeling you didn't know you probably had. I really am, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can a high school student um, cope with all this information, all this knowledge that they're being given? Yeah, that's a great question. Students can um, cope with um, this over... <laughs> overzealous, <laughs> I don't know, overwhelming knowledge. Um, and other things in honestly many different ways. This is a hard, <laughs> a hard, it's not a one word question um, or one word answer to your question. Um, there are many different paths students can take to, to get help. So um, they can talk about it <laughs> with each other. So the peer led, um, they can learn what resources are out there. Um, there's like many different ways of therapeutic help, right? Like they can obviously see a therapist, you know, um, but then also like talking with friends, teachers, family members, um, sometimes channeling feelings of anxiety into uh, advocacy. Um, Body-based practices are really, really helpful, especially for people who are struggling um, with overwhelm or anxiety. Uh, so that can be something like yoga. Um, meditate. People always say meditation, but actually meditation can be really difficult and contraindicated if your anxiety is too high because that will make your anxiety higher. So um, it, it's learning what you need in that moment and trying to find a different path, like what path fits with that to build, to build the skill set that you need. Yeah. So it wasn't a specific answer I just gave you, but um, it's because there are so many different avenues you can take. So what specifically do you do for Bring Change to Mind? I know you said you're the Southern California coordinator. So I'm the senior manager of California, oh, I and um, I, I do um, manage our Southern California schools. So uh, working at a nonprofit, we have a pretty small team, so we all wear a lot of hats. <laughs> um, so I would say like the, the basics of what I do is I help manage um, 55 high schools here in Southern California. So. LA specifically, but um, kind of greater LA as well. And then I also, um, on the state level, I help, um, I manage two employees. So I help them uh, with the different aspects of them managing their clubs throughout the state of California. And then I help really look at how to share our mission and grow our mission throughout the state of California. And that looks like partnerships, collaborating, different things like that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But it's um, a very eclectic job because we do um, event planning. <laughs> we work with students. We present at conferences. So one day I might be looking up what is the best and coolest bouncy house to have at our student summit? And then maybe the next day I'm talking to somebody at like the state legislative level. <laughs> so I'm really all over the place. <laughs> what you expected you were gonna be doing when you were a kid? What did you think you were gonna do? Oh my gosh. I mean, I think um, like everybody, you know, my my plans always change. <laughs> like. When I was a really, really little kid, like any other child, I'm like, I want to be a ballerina. 
and I didn't do ballet. And I'm like, I want to be an ice skater. I did do ice skating. And then I'm like, I'm going to play basketball professionally. So just like all these random things. I think when I got serious, I looked into nursing for a bit. And then I looked into being a therapist. Um, but I do, um, for anybody who's looking into going into the mental health field, there's actually so many different professions you can go into. It's not just being a therapist or being a psychiatrist or being a social worker. There are really creative and unique jobs that are still within the mental health field. Um, for example, my job, <laughs> um, working at a mental health nonprofit, or if you are a graphic designer, um, there are lots of organizations out there that are still within the mental health field and you can work for them creating graphics or if you're a videographer. Like there's so many random things that you can still lend your skill set um, within the mental health field. And we are really helping, we, we have some different programs and partnerships out there where we're really trying to push more people to go into the mental health field uh, because it is a field where there are not enough people um, and definitely not enough representation. There's um, very little diversity in the mental health field. Uh, so trying to get more diversity and more people coming into the field to, to help people. Yeah, it seems like you were also really wanted to help people even when you wanted to become a nurse or... Yeah, I always wanted to go kind of into a helping profession. Um, and the other thing too is with like me wanting to become a therapist, um, I realized not that I am, don't want to or am not good at sitting with people in their pain, but I my specific skill set that I... I figured out is like, I'm, I'm a really good, like cheerleader. Like I'm a good pumper upper, like motivator. <laughs> um, and this job is more, more in that direction. And so it's also looking at what your own skill set is and what you're good at and seeing where you can fit in that. You don't have to like fit into a specific hole or, you know, circle or square. You can, you can look more. <laughs> We would like to thank our generous sponsors and partners, Michael J. LeBeau, Norman Aid Peer Counselors, KBEV, and of course, we'd like to thank our listeners. Stay safe and make today well lived. <laughs>